Welcome to the Woe Podcast about horses and horsemanship. I'm John Hare, and you found the place where we talk horses. Bill Oliver has spent a lifetime with horses. He grew up in Eureka, California, and spent much of his youth riding, packing, and hunting in the Cascade Mountains. After high school, Bill moved to Wyoming and worked for Wilderness Outfitters. In 1991, he joined the Forestry Service as a lead packer. He knew a lot about packing, could ride or pack anything, but realized he needed to learn more about horses when he came across trainers like Monty Roberts and the Dorrance Brothers. His knowledge and experience grew, and after retiring from the Forest Service, he trained horses for the famed Top Notch Horse Sale in Cody, Wyoming. Realizing he has a unique style of natural horsemanship, Bill wanted to share his knowledge and, along with his wife Jody, formed Oliver Horsemanship. This year, Bill has a full schedule of clinics ranging from basic horsemanship to roping to cold starting. On the line today from Cody, Wyoming, I'm looking forward to learning more about Bill Oliver Horsemanship. Good morning, Bill. Welcome to the Woe Podcast. Good morning, John. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you all. I've been doing a little bit of background reading on on your website, and you started out with the Wilderness Outfitters, and what kind of caught my eye was it was with Hall of Fame outfitter Jake Clark. Uh, You know, for my listeners and myself, what is a Hall of Fame outfitter? Every year, outfitting associations, you know, honor special outfitters, outfitters and guides and that, that have established themselves as really special individuals within the industry of outfitting and guiding. And in the case of of this, you know, it it refers to wilderness outfitting with backcountry summer pack trips way in deep in the heart of the wilderness country of the Yellowstone area, Yellowstone National Park and the six national parks that surround Yellowstone. Everybody kind of refers to that as the greater Yellowstone region. And everything is pretty much foot foot or horseback because uh, there are no roads. It was all, it's all been designated wilderness. And so a lot of big game hunting, summer fishing pack trips, a lot of big mule strings, horses, real remote country, some of the most remote country, honestly, in the lower 48 states. And so to work in that industry, of course, that's that's how you're making a living is with your horses and mules and in the back country. And what did you do for that? You know, it, this is kind of a funny story. I, I'll, I'm almost 60 years old now, John, but looking back when I first came to Wyoming and and had the I guess I'm going to say blessed with the opportunity to go to work for Jake and Kay Clark out of Powell, Wyoming. You know, I was a young 18-year-old kid like a lot of us were. I I was a little undecided whether I was going to go to school and play baseball and try to play baseball in college. Was I going to go in the military? I I was just a little little undecided on all those things. And, And looking back, I guess this is kind of some of the funny part of the whole story. I I wanted so bad to be a horse hand, be a cowboy, probably from the time I was a little boy. I jumped at the opportunity to go to work for Wyoming Wilderness Outfitting at 18 years old. People won't hardly believe this, but I went to work for $10 a day in room and board. (laughs) Believe it or not, the babysitter would show up and watch the children of the Clarks and probably make more money than I did <laughs> shoeing horses and mules that day. So I guess to paint the picture, that's how bad I wanted it. That's how bad I wanted to be in the mountains, how bad I wanted to be a horse hand and a cowboy. And I did kind of come from some country in California, not too far from the pretty well-known Red Bluff Bull and Gilding Sale there in Northern California. I grew up kind of in that country, which is kind of bridal horse type country Mm -hmm. um, in that part of California. And so I I had a few little pieces of the puzzle put together. My dad's family always had horse raised horses in the San Joaquin Valley of California, roped and showed horses and things like that, you know? So when I came to Wyoming, it was a whole new, whole new set of dynamics, you know, making a living in the wilderness, like I said, packing horses and mules. And I, I just, I fell right into that and absolutely loved it. 
Can you give me an idea of like what a typical ride would be like a, a wilderness ride? What would you do on a on a pack trip? Well, typically you're jumping off of the end of a road somewhere and you're going into the back country and it might be a seven to 10 day type trip. It's all horseback trails from there. And, you know, seven to 10 days, it can be a destination type trip where you may ride anywhere from 15 to 30 miles into the back country to a debt predestined camp, or it might be a progressive type trip, which a lot of summer pack trips are, which is progressive you're loading up and you're packing and you're moving and you're going every day and you know that type of thing a uh, lot of miles in the saddle a lot of lot of uh, things going on there a lot of outfitters don't have the budget to buy you know a lot of really expensive horses and mules and so you know this particular outfitter that i worked with i we bought a lot of stuff that came out of the killer pens in billings montana you know, we took those horses and mules to the mountains and they got a job. And of course, in the mountains, there's no round pens, there's no arenas, there's, you're just out on the side of the mountain. And it's kind of a, it was really a, a school of hard knocks, if you will, to figure out how to develop methods and techniques and work through things. Uh, some of that stuff, looking back, you know, the old school, a lot of that stuff was a bit on the forced horse training type side. And, you know, my philosophy and methods and some things have changed, of course, over the years. And I'm a little different type of horse trainer for sure than what I was when I was a young, aspiring 18, 20 year old cowboy. But, you know, it's amazing. I I would say probably 60 some percent of those horses and mules that we literally bought right out of the killer pens in Billings, Montana, wound up being productive citizens in an in an outfitting program to one level or another you know and i really owe you know the experience and the learning part of all that uh, you have to look at jake clark as one of my for sure biggest mentors with with all that part of who bill oliver is so the riders the people that you were leading were they of all different experience because they had to ride those horses too right sure the outfitting part you know we referred to them as dudes of course and that's just an affectionate term that's used in the outfitting industry but you know they're people with little to no skill level whatsoever and so you have to have really solid seasoned livestock to put them on that are going to take care of them in the back country and things like that. So it's, it's in line with kind of your whole dude ranching outfitting type program. Right. You know, years later, as things started to transition for me and I went to work for the forest service, I uh, kind of did a lot of things through my twenties and all that with the outfitting and guiding was named the guide of the year one year here in Cody, Wyoming and some things like that. And then in 1991, I had the opportunity to go to work for the United States Forest Service with a regional pack string that traveled all over five states throughout the Rocky Mountain West. And, you know, we worked and packed on fires, wrecked airplanes, corpses, you name it, pretty much moved anything that could about be moved with horses and mules. And again, that, that job was started out geared that way with horses and stuff in the back country. And ultimately kind of worked myself into a position of more of an administrative role eventually with the Forest Service and spent 22 years there. And when I retired and left the Forest Service, I managed about a million acres of wilderness, just a little over a thousand miles of backcountry trails and 46 different outfitter and guide permits, which which was quite a, a turnabout, you know, for the young man who came from came to mm-hmm. Wyoming for $10 a day in room and board and went to work for an outfitter to the one that was the administrator, basically supervising and administering almost 50 outfitter and guide permits. And so that's just a little bit of the background with the Forest Service. And it was it was all in this greater Yellowstone area. Once I came back to Cody, I uh, was here on the Shoshone National Forest, which a lot of people don't know, but for your listeners out there, it's, it's the first and oldest national forest that was set aside with the Yellowstone Timberland Reserves in 1891, and yeah. it's referred to as the Horse Forest. That's kind of the nickname, and so I, I couldn't have landed in any better place for someone like me, and through my years with the Forest Service, I was really blessed in the sense that um, I also ran the stock program. You know, we had Oh, always right in that neighborhood of 
75 to 100 head of horses and mules. And I had a chance to be exposed to, you know, some, some trainers that are, you know, kind of household type name type folks, you know, the Ray Hunt, the Monty Roberts of the world, the Dorks of, right. and I really started to become exposed to natural horsemanship in kind of a different way, a different approach to some things. While I'm not really a protege of any one of those guys, I'm a lifetime study of a lot of those guys. And I, I think Bill Oliver, when people come to our clinics and watch things that I do, it would be fair to probably say they'll watch me do things horseback and say, wow, that's all kind of a Ray Hunt type thing right there. Or they might watch me talk about face up, join up, follow up, and they would say, uh, wow, that's kind of a Monty Roberts kind of looking type thing there. Mm-hmm. I guess what makes me just a little bit unique is that while I'm not a protege of any one of those guys, I have a lot of methods and techniques that we implement in our clinics and everything that sort of incorporate all of that, but it's also kind of mixed in with the production side of the things that really comes from my background as a forest ranger and an outfitter and, and some things like that. You know, my wife and I have also ran cattle and, and done the ranching thing. And so, you know, there's a production side in the sense that at some point you have to go up on the mountain and you got to bring the cows home or, or you need to get to the back country and set that camp. And so there's a production side of getting the job done that sort of is incorporated all along with what I call kind of my take of natural horsemanship. Right. Right. A lot of that came from, from Jake then because you had to get those horses and mules from the killer pen and then learn how to, to make them usable in a very short amount of time? Yes, I would say so. But as as later on in years, you know, my methods and techniques that I implement, like, for example, today, are quite a bit different than what we did back then. Honestly, some of those methods were pretty, they're pretty fast paced and, and a bit, I don't want to use the word harsh, but it was hard work and wet mm-hmm. saddle blankets and a lot of miles. And we went there pretty quick to be getting things sorted out and figured out. There wasn't a whole lot of a place for, uh, well, he's just not really ready to ride today. So we're going to mm-hmm. run him around in a round pen and poke him with a carrot stick and run a ball under him. You know, I mean, I, not trying to be critical of anybody else that's out there or their programs, but my stuff was a very no nonsense, get the job done type of an approach. And and like I said, in in years later, as I develop more of a natural horsemanship type of an approach, it's it's all kind of unique, I think, in the way that I present that. How much of a difference is there, in your opinion, between the horses and the mules that you were using for the pack strings? Well, mules, of course, they're just a different creature. There's a, there's a lot of clinicians and horse trainers out there who really don't care to deal with mules if you don't understand mules and understand that just, you know, the thinking side of their brain, how they process things is completely different than a horse. And so... Mm-hmm. You know, once once you understand mules and you know how to process all that, you know, you just work through that. You work forward with that. But I do do things a little bit different with mules. For example, when I'm driving stuff horseback in a round pen, I always make sure that I show that mule that release really fast. You need to be a little quicker and, and some things with mules and how you present that release, say, versus a horse. Because if you lose forward motion with a mule, boy, they just really have a tendency to kind of lock down on you. And it's really, with a mule, it really comes from that self-preservation instinct that the mule has. A lot of, you hear the old term, stubborn as a mule. Mm -hmm. That's really not really what is an accurate depiction of the mule. It's not really a stubborn thing. It's a self-preservation thing. But once you understand that, you know how to work through that with a mule, you just move forward. Right. Again, reading through your bio, there was a horse called Roadmap that kind of changed your direction, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I'm almost 60 now and a long line of a lot of horses and different things. Horses have taught me a lot. You know, I talked a little bit about who my mentors are. And like I said, some of them would be the household name type clinicians that a lot of people will all recognize their names. 
Others would be very accomplished horse hands, and absolutely not all from just the walk of life of the outfitting industry. I, I'm talking about ranchers and forest rangers, and my life with horses has been influenced by all those type of people. But more importantly, is all the different animals that I've worked with, you know, which really takes you to that place. You really develop a unique ability to read the horses and the and everything, you know, and it. I tell that to people all the time in our clinics, you know, you can get wadded up and stuck on technique. You can go watch videos on TV. You can even go attend clinics, but that'll teach you a lot of times about technique. What it doesn't teach you is in my case, I'm in my fifth decade now of trying to sort through and read horses and mules. And pretty soon you get just an uncanny ability to psychologically make a read on that individual based on your decades of experience and and how many you've worked with. Right. And that's kind of a recurring theme on the podcast is that a lot of our audience is the recreational rider. And we have one horse, maybe two horses that we deal with all the time. So in our Mm -hmm. world, it's hard to learn the broad spectrum of horsemanship skills that you need because you're, you're dealing with just one brain one personality so it's right you know it makes it a little bit more challenging for us particularly if our horse knows our the holes in our training and they usually figure that out pretty quickly right we have a term around here that we use it's called what's your number (laughs) and uh katie o'brien who does all of our our social media and marketing and advertising for us kind of came up with that. And and I really like it because she says, you know, what's your number? Meaning, you know, is this only the second or third horse you've ever worked with? Or, or in the case of someone like me, I've probably started well over a thousand colts, just start, just in colt starting. Mm -hmm. That's not talking about rope horses or bridle horses or pack mules or any of those types of things. And so I totally understand why that's a reoccurring thing because that's the struggle for most people today. It's really hard to develop that ability to read all those different individuals. Is it a resistant? Are they in the resistant camp? Are they in the scared camp? Uh, Is it a learned behavior thing, you know, and on and on it goes. And so it's difficult. It's very difficult for that recreational user, but it, but you know, they can move forward so much faster with a good mentor and someone helping them see those things. Right. You know, we we talked about different horsemen and people that you've learned from and some of the horses. And I understand that you had a Hancock horse by the name of Blue Duck. And did that kind of steer you towards wanting to learn more about natural horsemanship? Yeah, so there you go again, John, kind of like I said, A lot of my stuff wasn't only born out of necessity to get a job done. A lot of it was born of necessity trying to get figure out how to get through to or get by with a particular individual. You know, but in this case, Blue Duck was a particular horse. And yes, he was a he was a Leo and Hancock bred horse. And a lot of people hear Hancock and right away, well, they're stubborn and they're hard headed and they're just going to buck. Same thing with a lot of the run and quarter horses, you know, well, they're just, you know, they're a dash for cash or a streak and six, so they're going to be hot and and on it goes. And I, I think as you talk about horses and everything, you can't deny the fact that there's horses that are genetically predisposed to be a certain way. I think, unfortunately, sometimes that gets used as a crutch get through things when maybe the training isn't going too well when people make those comments and say, well, what do you expect? The right. truth is, is that, you know, I, some of the best horses I've ever rode have been Hancock horses. You know, they're tough, they're sturdy, they can really hold up. But I've rode, I've rode such a mix of horses. That's just one line of lineage type quarter horses. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I think sometimes people do underestimate genetically being predisposed to be a certain way. If somebody doesn't agree with me on that, you know, go talk to a rodeo stock contractor about bucking horses. I mean, they will tell you real quick how they selectively breed 
to have the best bucking horses they can have. So I I think I'm probably making the point there for the genetic predisposed to be a certain way. You know, we wouldn't ask a border collie to go jump out of a boat like a Chesapeake Bay or a, (laughs) a Labrador retriever to get a duck or a bird. For the same reason, we wouldn't try to run the derby with a draft crop. I don't want to sound like I'm just the professor of the obvious, but these are a lot of things that your recreational users, sometimes people see a horse and it's just a horse. A horse is a horse, right? They don't Mm. realize these things. Like you said, you've done a ton of colt starting. When -hmm. you go in to start a colt, does it help you to know the background of that horse, that it's a Hancock or a Dash for Cash horse? Or do, would you sometimes go, let me just start with this horse and figure out where its personality really is? You know, it's interesting that you ask that question. We we have this happen all the time with our clinics. And when I say this, I mean no disrespect to anyone. But somebody will want to start off on a, a long-winded dissertation and story for me about why he's got the heaves and why he's got this or why he's got that and the truth is is in if you just give me that horse for about 10 minutes the horse is going to tell me more than more than they would have told me probably in an hour right. it's fine people of course that you know their horses for a lot of them are kind of like their children and their pets you know and they just they're attached and they want to tell you the story so Sometimes you have to just afford them the opportunity to do that. But the truth is, is the horse is going to tell me way more in that round pin with me driving him horseback. I'm going to find out if he's lame. I'm going to find out if he's resistant. I'm going to find out if he's scared. I'm going to find out if he will go around there and pick up the correct lead or is he disunited? Is he crossfired? Is he, you know, I'm going to find out so much in about 10 minutes in that round pin stuff that they didn't even know about their own horse. But again, I, I've been doing this for quite a long time now. And your specialty is cold starting? Um, I'm not sure if I would say that that is my specialty. Probably working cold starting and working with young horses for sure would rank up there at the top of the list. We also specialize in making some pretty high-end bridle type horses, finished bridle horses. All of my clinic horses are quite advanced finished type. I, some guys don't like to use the term finished because you're never finished, but I right. mean, they're, they're very advanced bridle type horses. I think from the young horse to moving to all the way to that really high-end bridle horse that you can ride one-handed, lead a pack string, swing your rope, eat your sandwich, whatever, That is probably some of my unique specialized stuff along with the cult starting as well. We do a special clinic called the Big Misunderstanding, and it's all about bit spurs and bozelles, where we really get down in the weeds on bit spurs and bozelles, which I've found a lot of people just really don't understand, you know. A uh, lot of misconceptions about the use of those different types of tools, for example, like spurs, which have really been around clear since medieval times. You know, you earned your knighthood and you were given a pair of spurs. If you disgraced the knighthood, they took you out in public and chopped the shank off your spurs right in public because mm-hmm. you disgraced the knighthood. So we're talking about some things that are so old, they're all new again. So Spurs, I think the biggest thing that I see there is so many people think spurs are just for forward motion. And and in the class that we teach, spurs really, if you gig your horse to make him go in very short order, that's about all you can use a spur for. And for me with spurs, the, the correct application of spurs really is way more about suppling and about communication. I use my spurs for those two things. I don't I don't use my spurs to gig my horse to make him go. So that's just one little one. So I know the suppling part using the spurs, but I don't quite understand the communication part. So the communication, I use this for a lot for directing the mind. So picture it like this. For the, for the best way I could explain it, maybe on the phone like this. So let's just say you were sitting in the grandstands and I walked up behind you at the football game and tapped you on the right shoulder. Instinctively, your head's going to swing around to the right. Right. Okay, so when we clear the rib and direct the mind, like on a young horse, where you put your spur in there and and, and roll your rowel or whatever, 
that's the best analogy I could give you, I guess, right. on the phone. And so with spurs, just like with, say, from a snaffle bit to a finished bridle horse, of course, you have a direct rein and you have a support rein. Well, with spurs, you have a direct foot and you have a support foot. And so you have to teach a horse to come to it before you ask the horse to yield away from it. And so it's the same principle as a snaffle bit and a direct rein in your hand. You're teaching that horse to come into your hand with a direct rein first, way before you're ever going to put a support rein against his neck or to have right. him yield away from it. Right. I think the problem is that people a lot of times don't realize that you need to have a horses coming to pressure before you can actually ever ask them to yield away. And so missing that step in there of becoming too pressure, they wind up getting their horses sort of jumping and running away from pressure, not yielding away. Right, right. That's a good explanation. And so you were talking about the bits and stuff. Do you start with a snaffle and then work your way? Where do you go to the bazelle and... We typically start all our colts at two and three year olds, typically in a snaffle bit, and usually sometime in the three and a half year old part of the the horse's life, from there to four, we transition into a kind of like a, a heavy five eighths type Hackamore Bozell. And the reason that I really like to do that is in the fourth year, you know, horses getting their final set of teeth, and that's kind of in a traditional vaquero type fashion or uh, mm -hmm. traditional vaquero style of building a bridal horse. You know, there was a reason why they rode those four-year-olds a lot in the Hackamore Bozell because they got out of their mouth. You know, they're cutting their final set of teeth at four. And I've rode a lot of horses that get really tender in their mouth right then. And so I prefer to switch into like a 5 age Hackamore Bozell with like a horsehair Makati type setup and then transition down to a half inch and then eventually down to like a three eighths, very light Bozolita. And you can switch into where the horse, you're kind of riding with the two rein system at that point. Right. And, you know, and of course that's down the road headed toward a bridle horse. I have rode tons and tons of horses where we out of the Hackamore Bozell and that we also came right into like a transition style bit if the horse is going to go more into a performancey type thing, roping in the arena and things like that, you know, we could talk bits all day, but, you know, there's certain bits and everything that are designed and, and work well for roping, some for barrel racing, some for the, you know, the rainers and the cutters all kind of have what they like. That's all fine. That's more than fine. It's geared a little bit more toward that particular discipline where that horse is going to go. For me and my clinic horses and that type of stuff, and the ultimate Cadillac type mountain trail horse, you know, or ranch horse or clinic horse for me, you know, I'm kind of working toward that really elite high end bridal horse. Right. And one question that I, I often ask my guests too is that when you're going through your progression of bits, you go snaffle, bozell, and then into a more advanced bit, do you ever go backwards and and go back to the Bozelle or go back to the Snaffle? And is there value in doing that? Oh, most, most certainly. I actually have that happen a lot. I'll get horses that are older horses, maybe in a clinic type setting, and they're kind of riding them in a, in a straight bit, let's say, but it's just not right. The horse is counter arcing or doing some things and you need to drop them back into a transition style type bit. You know, you're working a little bit with the direct rein and support rein at the same time. You're, you're maybe working to clean up some things on your lateral flexation that isn't in there really good on the neck and clearing the ribs and disengaging the hindquarters. And then, of course, ultimately, if you're working on your vertical flexation right down the middle, which is the pole and the jaw and elevating the back and kind of helping a horse get their rear end up underneath them, like maybe for a a little bit of a sliding stop or something like that. A lot of times I will take older horses and drop them back down to get some things fixed that just weren't put in there quite right. And then, then move back forward again. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately for me, I'm always trying to advance that horse and kind of working toward the one rein Cadillac style horse to ride, you know, because the truth is really, if you're, like I said, a little bit ago, if you're going to rope, 
you need that other hand free. If you're going to lead a pack string, you need a hand that's free. If I'm going to work in a clinic and use a flag while I'm maybe working colts and doing things, I need that hand free. If I'm going to work with a stock whip, I need to have a hand free. So ultimately, I'm always working toward that one-handed type bridle horse. And it amazes me how many horses I see at the clinics that show up and you know, they're 10, 12 years old and they're still in a snaffle, an O-ring or a D-ring snaffle or, or some type of a transition bit. And that, that's fine. It, it's very obvious that the horse is riding there because that's the level the rider rides at. The rider literally has no idea how to progress. Like, for example, let me, let me put it like this with a Bozell. When you transition from a snaffle bit to a Bozell, it's the first time that you actually really start to push the horse rather than pull the horse. So when you pull, let's say, for example, with your left hand as a direct rein and a snaffle, that's a direct pressure in the corner of his mouth. When you pull with your left hand in a Hackamore Bozell, it puts pressure out on the right, out on the right side of his nose and his jaw. And you're starting to push the horse for the first time. You start to program that in there where you push the horse instead of pulling him. And then when you start to lay those horsehair reins against his neck, you start to support him and push him. So it's a great way to transition that horse into getting him to start neck reining. Right. And of course, when he starts coming off of that, he'll start coming off of your support foot. A lot of people just, unfortunately, just don't savvy that. They know how to sit up there and ride one with two hands and pull him everywhere, but they have no idea how to get that horse really neck reining. And just... To, you know, because I'm in that camp, I'm going to defend us poor people. It, they've made bits so complicated that it's very mm-hmm. difficult for us to understand. And I mean, how many types of leverage bits there are out there? And right. every time right. as a as not a novice, but as a less experienced horseman, as you try a different bit, there's always somebody there going, ah, that's not the right one for you. This is the right one for you, or that's the right one for you, or you've got too much of this and not enough of that. How many bits do you actually go through in developing a horse? And does a guy like me really stand a chance, you know? Well, actually, I think that that's one of the things, John, that we in our one clinic, the big misunderstanding, I'm a bit of a myth buster on that. Let me say this. First of all, the the bridle reins and the bits that are being used are only as good as the hands that they're in. Right. And so, for example, somebody sees a a bridle horse with with a spade or a whether it's a spoon spade or a a frog spade or whatever, they look at that and a lot of people don't, they think that that's just some kind of medieval type bit. They don't understand that the weight and things like that are for head carriage and, and, and a horse, it's not a training bit. It's an elite bridal horse bit, but that's the far end of the spectrum. How many do I have in the middle? You would probably be shocked and so would everybody else out there if I told you what a small different number of bits and bozels and stuff I actually have as far as different styles and all that. My snaffles are just a plain O-ring or a D-ring snaffle, either with split reins or a Makati type setup. I like slobber straps because they kind of put a little weight in there to accentuate my release and feel. You know, so there you go. I just told you, pretty simple D-ring, O-ring snaffles, what I use to start them in. I like plain old sweet iron, maybe with a little copper in my, I don't really need a bunch of fancy silver or any of that to make it any better. Right. I've got some old sweet iron bits I've rode. I don't know how many horses in, they're practically wore out. Um, A handful of some transition bits that would lean a little toward like a Tom Thumb or an Argentine snaffle. They're just very short shanked transition type bits. I have a little handful of those for some things, mainly because I, a long time ago, when I used to sell more horses, I could have a really nice horse in a Hackamore's Bozell and I couldn't hardly sell one. (laughs) If I put him in a transition bit, all of a sudden everybody looked at him and said, well, I can ride that sucker. Okay. (laughs) So I, I have those. And as far as fixed bit, 
I have a couple of different grazing bits that I use and a sweet water bit with a lot of tongue relief and some things like that that I introduce like for the first time in the horse's mouth for a solid mouthpiece. And I move through those pretty quick and I'm in into the into a regular bit. I have worked with people before, you're gonna laugh at this, and they take me to their tack room on their trailer or their tack room at home and they open the door and my lord, there's a hundred different bits in there and they're they're just like what you said. They're so what's happened I feel is a little bit in the industry, they've made some of this so complicated for everybody to figure out where everybody would just talk a little bit about more what what the basics are, we could probably guide a lot of people in a little better direction. In my early horsemanship career, uh, people would say, aren't you going to transition? I rode in a snaffle, and people would Mm -hmm. ask, aren't you going to transition up? And my response then was, I don't have the hands for it. Is that an okay philosophy to to have? Well, sure, there's okay. There's something to be said for all that. So, for example, for a minute, go back to the old some of my early days in the influence was in the outfitting and dude ranching industry where you have dudes, you know, you have kids and people that have never rode horses. Well, you're most certainly not going to some type of a spade bid or something like that in that horse's mouth. No, you're going to just do the opposite uh, with an old dude horse. You're going to put maybe a, just a plain Jane little transition or something in there uh, because those hands, all those different hands that are riding that horse, their hands are not good. The releases are not always good. And so you, you need to put something in there that has a lot more forgiveness to it. You know, the old dude horse pretty much probably knows his job. He'd probably about walk up and down the trail with a halt and a lead rope on. You know? Exactly. So I have a talk with a lot of folks in our clinic. We call it the program talk. And what you're touching on there a little bit, John, is, Everybody has a different program. It doesn't really make one person's program right or another person's program wrong. It just makes them different, right? Right. It really comes down to what's your program. If you're a cowboy that sometimes wears two horses out a day and rides six of them a week, you know, you can kind of ride a project cowboy horse. If you're a doctor or an attorney or an accountant and, and your horse is your recreational pursuit to go out on a little trail ride, uh, on a weekend ride and take your fishing pool or something, you know, you're not going to do well with that cowboy type horse. That's a project, right. you know, that cinches up tight and things like that. So it, it all goes to the program. You know, what do you need? What do you want? What are you looking for? You know, if you're a performance person and it's all about your discipline, roping and running barrels or things like that, you know, that's a different thing. You're in your focus. That's your program. That's where you're going. Right. And through your clinics and the teachings that you do, as that guy that's a recreational rider, his horses may be ridden twice a week or three times a week, what do you find is the biggest thing they tend to struggle with with their horse? Well, one of the biggest things that I see, I guess, with that right there is that sometimes people struggle because they don't have the right horse that fits their program. In other words, they have a horse that requires more riding and more maintenance and doesn't do as well if it sits with time off. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of that. Because I don't mean to suggest that they ought to be headed to the the killer pens. That's not what I'm saying at all. Those horses will fit somewhere, but they fit fit better somewhere in a different kind of program. Mm -hmm. So, for example, green on green doesn't always work super, super good. Yeah. If you're riding a lot of, you want to ride a lot of colts and things like that, that does work a little better with somebody that's a little bit more handy, even though we do do a lot of stuff like we do at the Nile with youth and the youth fellowship program up there with kids and colts. I think that that's one of the biggest things I see there. The other thing that I see is you pretty much hit it when you said the recreational user. I I think today in our culture and our society, A lot of people, they didn't come from where I came from in the sense that they know what it's like to actually have to work horses and mules, and and that's partly how how you made your living. That was the job. So many people don't even know what a job would be, you know, and nor do their horses. You know, they don't know what a job is. They don't know what it is to get tired. They don't know what it is to actually have to go to work. And it's not really the people's fault. 
and it's not really the horse's fault. It just kind of is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I guess I, just the last thing I would close on that is kind, I'm kind of giving you three things instead of one thing. The last thing I would kind of close with on that as far as what I see a lot at the clinics is that everybody who's struggling or having a problem with their horse, not everyone, let me rephrase that, but many people want to hang that problem around the neck of the horse. In other words, I'm having this problem and they would like to just send that horse maybe to a trainer or a clinician or somebody for 30, 60, 90 days and just get it all fixed. I run into this a lot. I'll work with the horse just a little bit. And how do you tell, this is one of the hardest things across the bear for me. How do you look a person in the eye when they're telling you everything that's wrong with the horse and tell them, I don't need your horse for 30 days. I need your horse for about three days. I need you for three months. <laughs> And yes. and it's such a, when I say a cross to bear, it's, it's a hard thing. You know, I never, ever want to be that clinician that talks down to anyone. I never want to be that guy that's not still humble and feels blessed to, you know, be where I'm at in my life with horses and things like that. I, I don't ever want to come across as that guy. I see that a lot with a lot of different clinicians, unfortunately, and they get kind of accustomed to talking down to people. That That's not Bill Oliver. I, I hope I can convey that in the podcast here today. Right. But with that said, I don't advocate that the problem is always the horse. I guess I'll be the advocate a little more for the horse here. There's a lot of people that they need help figuring out some basic things. You know, if I could just barely reach them and explain the psychological part, for example, and how leadership and, dom and dominance and how that relates back to the old matriarch mare and a herd of horses and how you build that relationship on, on trust and respect. And there's discipline and there's healthy boundaries and all those things. If I could just share those things with people, if I could share basic groundwork with people to understand moving your horse on the ground and that, you know, how's it going to be beautiful when you're on his back when you can't even do anything on the ground here? So I'm a big right. advocate for all those things. Your horse is not, it's a living, breathing creature. You know, it's not like a hammer or a tool or something, you know, even a truck engine not running, right? You send it to the mechanic and he fixes the truck, you know, right. your horse is it's about the relationship and if the human is not willing to put the time into that to make it better from their side of the equation i they can send their horse to to me and i can train and work with that horse but he's it's almost like a kid in a foster home he's going to go right back in the messed up environment again and get treated poorly and it's just really kind of sad Right. I've seen that. And that was one of the reasons why I started the podcast 10 years ago is I knew that there was a lot more that I needed to learn to, just to be fair to my horse, you know. And, and right. I think that's what it's what it's about. It's all about learning to be a better rider will make your horse a better horse. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it's even learning how to be a better leader because, it, it you know, I use the analogy a lot of a dance. Mm -hmm. I don't know for the folks out there listening, but, you know, maybe they'll get a chuckle out of this. But I always ask this sometimes at my clinic, you know, have you have you ever went and tried to have how many of you like to dance, you know, and hands will go up in the air. And I'll, then I'll say, how many of you have a struggle with your spouse as to who's going to lead on the dance floor? <laughs> And I, and it's always kind of comical, you know, because in, in any case, I'll just, I don't want to get myself in too much trouble here in the podcast, but everybody will get my point. If you view this analogy as, as the same with your relationship with you and your horse, it's a dance. But in order for it to be a really pretty harmonious dance, someone has to lead and someone has to follow. And how do you establish that? And that's that's the whole psychological approach that we use to build that relationship to where, you know, face up, join up, follow up at liberty. You know, there's a real test right there. If your horse is not following you at liberty at the end of your face up and join up stuff, you, you know, you're headed right and they're headed left. You, it, you're not there yet. You haven't got there, you know. It's it's great that you mentioned that because we we ballroom dance and 
partner dancing and horsemanship are so very similar. I have to communicate to my wife which direction I'm moving just by how my body moves. And I have to be firm enough to get her to feel that, but not overly powerful so that she doesn't feel like she's getting pushed around the floor. And one dance instructor put it this way, he said, you're the frame and she's the picture. You want to make her mm-hmm. look as good as possible. Right. And I I think that with it's a great analogy. I use it all the time, the dance and your relationship with your horse. And it's it's pretty pretty cool to watch, like at, say, one of our cult starting clinics. And we do several of them where we'll, in four days, we'll start 20 colts maybe. And to see everybody out there doing their groundwork and and you watch that, and and it's a dance going on. You know, they're yeah. they're sending them left. They're flexing their neck. They're clearing their ribs. They disengage the hindquarters, and they move the front end through, just like a fluid dance, like a couple out there on the dance floor. And so, you know, when you get that going on the ground, and you get all that right, and then that transfers from there to on their back, and those bridle reins are in your hand. You know, now we're really getting somewhere. Right. You really feel connected. Yes. I think another thing I would just point out in the podcast, I spend a lot of time talking about this sometimes in the clinics, is one of the things I you asked me what I see a lot of. A lot of times people don't have a really great understanding of the difference between discipline and punishment. If you go grab Webster's and take a look and read the definitions, they're completely different. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two definitions of discipline. One is to discipline an action. The other one is to be disciplined like a soldier, self-discipline. But in the case of disciplining an action, you know, I, I am an advocate for healthy boundaries and keeping things safe with your horse. And so I am not. I'm not the horse whisperer that's going to go out there and just kind of sit down in the grass and hum to my horse and somehow hum him into the horse trailer. The horse has to come to understand that there's there's consequences for actions, there's boundaries. I'm a very, very tough disciplinarian on myself, and I'm a tough disciplinarian on my horse. But it's really just when you get to the point where you don't punish anymore and you just discipline the action, then you offer up that reaffirmation to the horse. Hey, buddy, I just love you, man. I think you're going to be great at this. You're going to be a champion at this. When you take that mindset that that's how you're going to approach things rather than to get mad and punish the animal, which really just brings about more resentment and distrust and fear. And I I wanted to throw that in there because we talked a little bit about some of the early techniques that I grew up with that were kind of borderline force training techniques a little bit and stuff. I don't want somebody to walk away from listening to this podcast and think, well, he's just all about discipline and old force training. No, right. no, I'm not. Anybody that comes to my clinic will tell you that I'll tell them all the time. You discipline that action. Now love on him. Love on him. Let him know he's doing good. It's all right. Yeah. You, you know, that's probably a, a good note to end on. Uh, you've got clinics coming up in Utah and Colorado and what about the uh, Northern International Livestock Exhibition in Billings? What's going on there? So that's a real cool program. This will be our fourth year with the Nile. Four years ago, we started a program where we would do a cult. We would do cult starts in our typical time frame of like the end of May, first of June, all of June, and then turn those colts out. Not really treat them like maturity horses. Turn them out. Let them just eat and grow up and then bring them back to the Nile in the fall. And we would do a restart with them in the fall. They're at the Nile all week. People could watch the horses and then the horses would sell in the horse sale, the gold buckle Nile select horse sale on Saturday. It really was a hit right from the beginning, even amongst the period of time with COVID and all that, which was posed some challenges. We worked through that. And so this will be our fourth year doing it. The focus of the Nile has kind of shifted a little bit to more of a youth fellowship type program where uh, it's actually uh, young kids. They have to be 14 to 21 years old, and the focus is working with them and with their cults and taking them through this process I just described. And basically, they're kind of a restarted cult, 
and they sell on Saturday. It's and it's a pretty neat thing. People have a chance to actually really watch the kids, watch the colts. You're kind of buying young horses that are a clean slate that have been started right with no mm-hmm. real problems or issues. It has just really taken off. That's very cool. I did want to ask you one more question. This might be uh, off the wall, but I always like to ask my, especially the the guys that have been out there in the trenches. I know you're you're probably very well known in the Wyoming and Montana area, but who do you think is the greatest unknown horseman that you've come across, and what did you learn from them? What skills did you did you pick up from them? The greatest unknown horseman. Just that energy uh, that you know. You know, that would be a tough one for me to answer because I've had several old mentors that, you know, people that helped me. There's a fellow by the name of Morris Mosman out of Raton, New Mexico, really was influential in, in helping me really figure, figure some things out as a young man with spurs and my feet and, uh, you know, some of those things that's probably not super well known, even though he trained horses with Dorrance's. A man by the name of Carl Jones, who's in his eight, and these gentlemen are all Some of them are not even with us anymore, but uh, Mm -hmm. Carl Jones, Ralston, Wyoming. Uh, His son, Casey Jones, of course, has competed and won the Ironman competition several times. Carl was a a great horse hand in his own right with a lot of things. Dwayne Hagen, uh, another Wyoming rancher and outfitter that's been a lot of time with Ray Hunt and, and some time with Pat Pirelli. A very good horse hand in his own right. You know, I'm trying to pay credit to some of my old mentors and things. As far as like somebody that's really good, that's maybe not known internationally or that kind of thing. I, you know, it's going to sound a little braggadocious, but you might be talking to him. (laughs) <laughs> there you go. I I have a quite a following, and we're pretty well established in Montana and Wyoming and Colorado, and Utah through the Rocky Mountain region here. Uh, we'll do clinics, and we'll be in all four states this year. But we don't do much on the east or west coast, that type of thing. And so we, we've kind of had most all the work and everything that we want right here. So we haven't pushed it a lot. Right. We haven't pushed to do things, and, and again, I don't want to upset anybody, but we haven't really chased road to the horse or cold starting competitions and things like that. I kind of have some reservations about some of those things. I'd like to think that I'm a little more in it for the horse than just to win the buckle. So. Right. And so if people want to find out more about your clinics or your horsemanship techniques in general, uh, where should we send them? Go to oliverhorses.com. We're on the web. Katie O'Brien does all our social marketing and media work there. There's uh, bio information there. Uh, Some of the stuff we talked about here today, there's a full clinic schedule there. There's everything you want to know if you want to book a clinic with us to come to your area, which we do. We do do quite a few private ranch clinics throughout Mm -hmm. kind of the Rocky Mountain West here where we show up and and it might even be a little bit of a round robin clinic. There might be a half a dozen colts to start, maybe a half a dozen older horses that have got this or that going on that we're going to try to work through some issues. Everything on the, on the website is there, BillOliverHorsemanship.com. There's also some videos on horses that we've sold in the past. Uh, our first big clinic that we have coming up is in Oakley City, Utah. We actually kick off in Casper, Wyoming here this month, and then we're down in Oakley City, Utah. Of course, you asked me about the Nile. The dates for that are the week of October 17th through the 21st there. It's really a neat deal with kids and that type of thing, and the Nile's actually building that program with us where we're going to continue working with youth there. And we're also in negotiations with University of Montana there in Bozeman to possibly do something that might start to involve working with college kids and a bunch of cults that were donated to the college. 
and we're also working right now with the Denver Stock Show a little bit. I don't know if we'll wind up there, but we're kind of visiting with them on that. Jennifer Boca, who used to be the manager at the Nile, who we started the whole Colt Clinic and everything up here at the Nile, is now the general manager at the Denver Stock Show, and so uh, we're just we're just excited to be doing what we're doing. We feel really blessed. The good Lord has been good to us. We just want to continue down this path, John, of helping people and helping them with their horses. And I tell people a lot of times, you know, if I can share one thing with you, one thing that you could take home and make your program safer or better, well, boy, what's that worth? Yeah, really. It's worth a whole lot. Well, it's been great, Bill. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk to me this morning. I'm sure my audience is going to get a real kick out of this. Okay. Okay. We look forward to maybe doing some more in the future with you. Maybe next round you'll have a particular subject or something that we want to address, and we'll just we'll talk through that. That sounds awesome. All right. Again, we just we thank you again for the opportunity, and uh, hopefully we we just have a great connection here with you, and we'll continue some more in the future. And that does it for this episode. As many of you know, the podcast is in its 11th year. We have produced over 250 episodes, and we just crossed the threshold of 500,000 downloads in over 100 countries. When I began the podcast in the back room of my office with a little digital recorder and a $29 mic, I didn't really know where it would go. I just wanted to talk to people about horses. It was frustrating at times. I probably quit at least twice a year. But then I would connect with someone who had something to say and I couldn't wait to share it with you. Half a million downloads isn't all that impressive in the big world of social media, but it's a big number to me. And I thank you for sharing this journey. Talking with horsemen like Bill Oliver is one of the reasons I enjoy doing this podcast. He has so much knowledge. There's no way I can amass the horsemanship skills he's gained over the years. But if I can take away a few nuggets of wisdom, well, it certainly helps strengthen the bond with my horse. If you're listening, I bet you feel the same way. Check out Bill's websites for clinics, events, and social media. I'm sure you'll find some great information. I'll have all the links at wopodcast.com. If you have any show ideas or suggestions for future guests, email me at john at wopodcast.com or connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram under the name Woe Podcast. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again for listening and sharing the podcast with your friends and riding buddies. Until next time, for Renee, this is John Hare saying, go have some fun with your horses. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.